Hey, Slider Crusaders, America is the greatest country in the world. Thanks so much for being here. Someone on my radio show, it's a couple weeks ago, maybe two, three weeks ago, said, Slater, how do we confront, how do we beat the narrative of the day, right? the Marxist victimhood narrative of today? And I said, we got to tell better stories. We have to tell better stories. The good stories are there. We don't have to make anything up. We just need to tell them. The left is very good at telling convincing stories that on a micro level, right? So they're very good at telling stories of, of like the poor and downtrodden victim. And they're also telling on a macro level, telling people how they should feel, right? You all, everybody should feel aggrieved. You should feel bitter. You should feel angry. You should have envy. You should feel, right? All this stuff. You should have hatred in your heart. So on a micro level and a macro level, they're very good at telling stories. This is why Marxism is appealing, right? First, you have a utopian vision. So there's a story there. Um, but it's, it's here's the utopian vision, and all these people are in your way. Everyone who has more than you got it from stealing from you. The, the, and this appeals to, as uh, Jordan Peterson calls it, the, the Cain-like aspect of the human spirit. Everyone who got something got it in a corrupt way. So that not only justifies my envy, which I think is the worst thing that can exist in your heart is envy. So this idea that someone else got there, uh, got what they got in a corrupt way, it justifies my envy and it justifies all the actions that I or I'm, the government may take to level the playing field and makes me look virtuous while doing it. <laughs> I mean, that's super appealing. Resentment is very powerful and people use it to manipulate you all the time. I'm reading this book by Sue Ellen Browder. Uh, she has two books. She has a new one called um, sex and the Catholic Feminist, and there's a reason why it's called that. Actually, it'll make sense in a second. And she has an older book called um, Subverted, How I Helped the Sexual Revolution Hijack the Women's Movement. I think it's like that. And she, she was a writer at Cosmo for, for over 20 years, Cosmopolitan Magazine in the 70s. Super interesting backstory. And she wrote that stories speak to our hearts, and they tell us not only how we might live, but how we should live. And that's why we must watch the stories that we tell and the stories we trust with a vigilant eye. And we're gonna, I'm gonna talk a lot about uh, her stories from Cosmo uh, another day. But anyway, I wanna tell the story here of Johnny Kim. This is a name we all need to know. This is a name your kids need to know. Johnny Kim, his parents were immigrants from South Korea. Uh, he was born just after they came here. He was born in 1984. His dad was a violent alcoholic. From as young of an age as, as he can remember, uh, he had this desire to protect his younger brother and mother from his dad. It was nearly daily. Johnny was scared to go to sleep because uh, his dad would wake him up in the middle of the night with a, a cold glass of water on his face, and then he would make him pick a, some possession of his that he would break in front of him. Right, imagine that. Imagine dad wakes up your 12-year-old you know, son and says, all right, you pick what I'm going to destroy of yours, so just this cruel torment and torture of his children and of course wife. And, and, and he did that because hurting his children was the only way to, or the best way to hurt his wife. So uh, fast forward till Johnny was about 17. And at that time, for many months at a time, on and off, his mom would be scared to be at home at night. So she would be at home during the day, make the kids dinner and then leave and sleep somewhere else. And the dad would come home drunk and all this. So one day, dad came home uh, early and mom was still there. This was, and it's amazing. Um, Johnny's telling this story, and he said, "It was February. It was February twenty first, two thousand two. Like, remembers it every single aspect of it. So he comes home early, and the family's there, and like shocked, right? And Johnny says he could smell the whiskey on his dad's breath, and he, he just he knew something." was different about this moment. I mean, they had a whole lifetime of days like this, right? But something was different about this time. Greater tension than normal. So his dad looked at Johnny, again, he was 17, and he said, uh, well, I think, actually, here it is in his own words. This is Johnny Kim on Jocko's podcast. My father came up to me, and some of the last words he said to me was, I'm sorry, Jonathan. And he pepper sprayed my face. Um... And then all I hear in the kitchen is my mother screaming for help and saying, he's got a gun. So 
uh, and then, you know, fight or flight, do you do what you need to do to protect the people you love? So I got up and I did my best to, to, to fight him and get that gun. Um, and you know, fought as hard as I could, as as strong as I guess a 140 pound year old kid could do at the time. Um, but I, I lost that fight. I still have a scar right around here um, from when my father was, he was able to get a hold of a dumbbell nearby and smash my head in with it. And uh, I think um, they kind of turned the fight and he was able to get his gun out of his pocket. He goes on, he says, by the grace of God, somehow the pleading, whatever it was, and Johnny said, it's, he kept saying over and over, it's not too late. Like, you, you, don't, you don't have to do this, it's not too late. Uh, his dad shot the gun in the air, uh, but didn't kill them and ran out the back door. So his mom calls 911, the cops come, the ambulance, they go to the hospital, he gets his head stapled, all that. Comes back home and he walks into his room, right? So it's like, imagine, the chaos, of the, that, like the whole thing, and you walk in your room and something was a little off. Johnny noticed that the, the furniture in his room was, like, moved a little bit. And it turns out that Johnny's ceiling had access to the attic. And the furniture was moved in, in just a way that someone could get access to the attic. So he told police he thinks his dad is still in the house hiding up in the attic. So police come and they section off the area. They get up there, they confront his dad. And, and as Johnny puts it, shots were fired and my father was killed. He's like a passive verb there, tense there. Uh, he said it was you know, obviously one of the saddest days of his life, but it was also a huge relief. He tells the story later when he was talking to the detective and the detective told him, son, your, your dad is dead. And he didn't say anything, he had like no emotion at all. And the, the sheriff or the deputy or whatever said, uh, son, this doesn't seem to be like terrible news for you. And Johnny said, uh, I'm relieved. So right up there, like one of the worst, like I'm not in the business of like ranking childhoods, but. Like, or like traumatic childhoods, but like that's got to be up there. Just terrified his entire life of his dad, of his dad, and uh, I'm sure there's also some thought in there that he's like responsible for killing his dad, even though he's not, right? But you would, he's the one who told police and then police, right? That being said, check out this line. All those experiences, while they were terrible at the time, I wouldn't take. I wouldn't trade any of that for anything. I would never want to trade that because everything that happened helped form me into the person I am today. And we'll talk about it. The teams mm -hmm. helped channel that into good. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, like, what do you? What? Think about that sentence. You're telling me, like, 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 Johnny, if you could go back to the beginning, right? So let's say you're up in heaven, you're with God, and God's like, hey, Johnny, listen, that was a real tough break I gave you there. Uh, you can go back and do it all again, okay? You can relive your life again, the abuse, the fear, every day you get, almost get killed by your father, the whole thing, you can relive that. Or you can live the privileged life of Mike Slater. White, middle class, great parents, happy life. What do you want to do, Johnny? He would choose his life again? Are you kidding me? The fear, the abuse, the trauma, getting slammed in the head with a, with a dumbbell by your dad. Like, what are you talking about? Why, how would you possibly choose that again? Because it made, it, it made him who he is. Booker T. Washington <clears throat> tells the story in his autobiography, Up From Slavery, of working in the salt mines. Uh, so that right after, so he was, Emancipation Proclamation was when he was nine years old, then he went to go work in the salt mines. Uh, when he was nine years old. And he talked about how dangerous it is and how things, you know, dynamite would explode prematurely and kill you or maim you and you just, you're just in the darkness all day and it's just a horrible. Here's what he said. He said, in those days, 
I used to try to picture in my imagination the feelings and ambitions of a white boy with absolutely no limit placed on his potential. I used to envy the white boy who had no obstacles placed in the way of his becoming a congressman, a governor, a bishop, a president. I used to picture the way that I would act under such circumstances. I mean, imagine he's in, he's in a salt mine. He's 10. Thinking about a different life. I used to picture the way that I would act under such circumstances, how I would begin at the bottom and keep rising until I reached the highest round of success. In later years, I confess that I do not envy the white boy as I once did. I've learned that success, here's the line, success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he has overcome while trying to succeed. And looked at from this standpoint, I have almost reached the conclusion that often the Negro boy's birth and connection with an unpopular race is an advantage so far as real life is concerned. With few exceptions, the Negro youth must work harder and must perform his tasks even better than a white youth in order to secure recognition. But out of the hard and unusual struggle through which he's compelled to pass, he gets a strength, a confidence that one misses whose pathway is comparatively smooth by reason of birth and race. From any point of view, I'd, I'd rather be what I am, a member of the Negro race, than be able to claim membership with the most favored of any other. Same thing that Johnny said. I'd rather go back and I wouldn't change a thing. Wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> I mean, Booker T. Washington, Johnny Kim, these guys, they have every excuse, every excuse possible to be bitter and resentful. And you couldn't blame them if they were. But they decided not to let it con con uh, consume them. And they turned these traumas into motivation and then a life to go and love and serve others. I mean, imagine if instead of this victimhood that everyone is constantly, like, like, this, like the little, like the literally called microaggressions. They're not even trying to hide it. It's called the microaggressions. Micro, they're teamed. That's what we're, like, you have, you have to be aggrieved all the time. Everyone's a victim all the time. Imagine if instead of that story, imagine if Johnny Kim was a household name. Now, I should say he soon will be. <laughs> uh, Johnny Kim went on to become a Navy SEAL and then uh, left the teams and went to Harvard Medical School. Because why not? And uh, now he's an astronaut. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's like... Do you guys have the picture? You can put the picture up. Of, like, here he is, like, on Halloween. Here's three Halloweens in a row of him in different costumes, right? Like, an astronaut, that's like a joke. He's like, hey, I'm a Navy SEAL, and, I, you know, I just graduated Harvard Med School. I'm a doctor now. So I'll be like, oh, yeah, now what are you going to do? You're going to be an astronaut? It's like, oh, actually, yeah, I'm an astronaut. I'm an astronaut, too. I'm going to be going to the moon in a couple of years. What? Are you kidding me? Imagine if permeating through our culture were stories like Johnny Kim of people overcome. It used to be. It used to be our culture. Stories overcoming obstacles, going through the worst of the worst, and still becoming a great man, and not only a successful career, but a great person. Uh, someone on Jocko's podcast commented, uh, the man can't hold a job. <laughs> right, but it's not even the job. It's not even what he achieved. It's the person that he became. And if you keep hearing stories like that over and over, that will change how you do everything. And it will change our country. Instead of hearing over and over and over again what a terrible country we live in, how hopeless your life is, and what a victim you are, the best way to defeat the ideology of the left is through story. And that's what we're going to do here. Johnny Kim's is a good place to start. That's a true story. I'm Mike Slater. Spread the word. Hey, Sider Crusaders. So we just shared that amazing story, and we're going to share a ton more stories on the show. The name of the show is True Story. But there's a difference between story and propaganda. And that's what I want to talk about here. This is how propaganda works. There's always a bit of truth to it. Um, people think propaganda is just, you just make up, make up whatever you want, but that's not quite it. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit of truth. It's selected truth. It's truth out of context. 
and it's used to sell products and ideas. So Sue Ellen Browder, we mentioned her a second ago, she worked at Cosmopolitan Magazine for 20 plus years. And uh, her second book, not, not the most recent, but the one before it, um, she talks about how the feminist movement and the sexual revolution were two different things. The right, feminist movement was over here, the sexual revolution was over here. We think they're the same, but they didn't start out that way. Cosmopolitan in particular, they pretended as if the sexual revolution was a freedom for women. And Cosmo, over time, kept equating them as the same, and then they ultimately did. Abortion is a good example of this. So abortion was always something that men wanted. Women did not want abortion. Women have a, they have a natural maternal instinct to keep their kid alive. It's the men who want to have sex without consequences. Men wanted abortion. Two guys in particular, Lawrence Later, uh, he was known as the father of abortion rights. He went to Harvard, 1941. He was the founding uh, chair of NARAL, which is the National, uh, what is it, National Abortion Rights Action League. Is that, N yeah, N-A-R-A-L, National Abortion Rights Action League. Uh, so it was, it was that guy, Lawrence Later, and then uh, there's another guy, Dr. Bernard Nathanson. He ran one of the largest abortion centers in the country, and he was a co-founder of NARAL. All right, so you have these two guys. On Dr. Nathanson's deathbed, he was dying on his deathbed due to old age, someone asked him what he wants the world to know. And he said, love one another. Abortion is not love. Stop the killing. Dr. Nathanson was the guy who came up with the, the line of, hey, you can be against abortion personally. You could be against it. But this is a decision that must be left between a mother and her doctor. Okay, so he was a, he was a doctor. I put that in quotes because he's murdering babies. But uh, he's the one who's like, hey, listen, you can be against it personally, but this is between a woman and her doctor, right? And that he was the guy who came up with it. So, oh, by the way, it all came crumbling down for Nathanson, again, co-founder of NARAL, when he saw his first ultrasound. Roe v. Wade was 1972 or three, I think three, uh, and ultrasounds weren't really widespread and popular until a couple years even after that, until after Roe v. Wade. Uh, so he, uh, when he saw his first ultrasound, he was like, oh, geez, and that's when it all came crumbling down. Check this out. This is uh, near the end of his life. I am Dr. Bernard Nathanson, formerly the director of the largest abortion clinic in the Western world, and I am the last surviving founding member of NARAL, the pro-abortion organization we founded in New York City in the late 1960s. We founded NARAL with the goal to export our pro-abortion mentality across the land. One of our strategies in order to mislead the American public was to deny what we knew to be true, that an abortion kills an existing human being. We denied that fact in an effort to mislead the American public and the courts of this land. I myself am personally responsible for over 75,000 abortions. This was the greatest mistake of my life, and legal abortion was the greatest mistake this nation has ever conceived. It must be brought to an end after 50 million deaths of unborn babies. I am Dr. Bernard Nathanson, obstetrician gynecologist, and the last surviving member of the NARAL group. Amazing, right? So these two guys were close to uh, Betty Friedan, which is the, the feminist mystique, and they worked to convince her to put abortion in the Women's Political Bill of Rights, which was 1967. So the Bill of Rights, I think there's only like seven points, and it was like, uh, no more employment discrimination, no more education discrimination against women, maternity leave, deductions for childcare expenses, stuff like that. And there were only, like, I think it was six or seven of them, and the very last one they snuck in there was about abortion. They, he, they called it uh, uh, like a right for a woman to control her reproductive life, or women's reproductive lives. That's how they put it, reproductive lives. So this group of women, they met in D.C. to put forward this, this Women's Bill of Rights, and abortion was added at the end. And of the 105 feminists who were there, 57 voted for it, 
which is 54% of the vote. The next day, Betty Friedan comes out and says, all women are for abortion. And the newspapers took the bait, put headlines about how women support abortion, boom, done, there's your propaganda. That's how that works. Think about that. Two men convince Betty to put in the Bill of Rights, snuck in there at the end, and only 54% of women, of the women who they're voted on, only 54% voted on. Now, I don't even know if those 50 women were in support of abortion, right? Maybe they just voted on the whole thing and they were like, well, uh, I don't really like the abortion part, but we'll just go with it because uh, these other things are so important and we've done all this work and we'd rather have these even if it includes that. So maybe even it wasn't even a majority of those feminists supported abortion. Because again, at the time, sexual revolution and the feminist movement were two totally different things. But boom, just like that, now all women have to support abortion. Isn't that amazing? There's your propaganda. And now you must support, now it's a women's rights issue. Amazing. So that's high level. On the ground, here's how it works. You had your Playboy magazine, which was all about sexual freedom, right? Worth noting, and I always note this whenever Hugh Hefner comes up. Hugh Hefner, he did not die as repentant as Dr. Nathanson did, but he died with far less dignity. He died in literal filth and squalor. He could barely even sell the Playboy mansion. And it was so clear when Hugh Hefner died what a sad life he lived. Not just at the end, but his entire life. What a sad, pathetic, miserable life he lived. And that's, you know, sucks for him, but it's worse because he deceived so many millions of people along the way. Uh, anyway, that's Playboy. But the Playboy for, woman, for women was Cosmo. The, uh, they were both published by Hearst. And by the way, the granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst said Cosmos way worse than Playboy in terms of how it influenced the, the readers to, to actively go and live uh, a destructive lifestyle. Uh, and she, she made the point, and you can agree with this or not, but she made the point that Playboy maybe made men fantasize about a certain lifestyle or whatever, and there's problems with that even, but Cosmo like, pressured young girls to go out and live a certain lifestyle. So here's where you enter Helen Gurley Brown. She wrote this book called Sex and the Single Girl, in 1962, uh, the cover, one of the, the tags on the cover says, sensational bestseller that torpedoes the myth that a girl must be married to enjoy a satisfying life. So this is like the precursor to Sex in the City that we have today. So she became the editor-in-chief of Cosmo for 32 years. She literally worked with Hugh Hefner to hire the right people, the right writers, to get the right vibe and all that stuff, right? They were all, all in alignment. Uh, so this is, one from Sue Ellen, this is from one of Sue Ellen's books. Again, she wrote there for over 20 plus years in the 70s. She said, Helen took Kinsey's idea, and we're gonna spend more time on this another day too, but Helen took Kinsey's idea of a woman as a sexual animal and figured out how to sell this image to insecure single women as their path to self-fulfillment and freedom. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, Helen was one of the leading women in the reduction of a, women's, of a woman's personhood to the level of sexual animal. In 1971, the year that I, as an ambitious 25-year-old landed a job in Cosmo's articles department, not one single woman I knew was hopping into bed with men on the first date, having affairs with married men, or cohabitating with her boyfriend. Not one. We've already seen that Kinsey's statistics did not apply to the average woman. His reduction of a woman's personhood to that of a pleasure-seeking, pleasure-giving sexual animal did not reflect the way most women were living their lives. So how are we to find women living this supposedly highly fulfilling, sexually liberated lifestyle and write titillating stories about them when these women didn't exist? As Cosmo's editor-in-chief, Helen had a simple solution. We just make them up. That's a luxury belief. You know, we talked to Rob Henderson a lot. He's the one who came up with this term, luxury belief. It's something elites say that they're champions of, but don't actually live themselves. The problem is these beliefs trickle down and they convince other people to actually live them and it destroys families in this case and destroys lives. Uh, Sue Ellen uh, did the same thing. Do we have, a, yeah, let me have a minute here. So uh, she actually found the, the memos that the editor-in-chief sent to all the staff about how to make stuff up. All right, so she's like, I remember getting these memos and I have them somewhere. She couldn't find them, she couldn't find them and then she found them in a box in the attic. So we have like the real life, actual like typed up memos from the 70s saying just make it all up if you need to. And one of the tricks was to not only make up the stories, but make sure you make the place not New York City, right? So when they're telling the story of, of women living these, these lifestyles, whatever, put it in Cleveland, put it in Des Moines, right? 
Because if you make the like like the like the shocking, I think she puts it like the shocking mores outside of New York City. Like if it's just in New York City, it's like, oh, that's just a weird, like progressive New York City thing. But if you can put it in Des Moines, then it's it seems way more widespread and accepted than it actually is. She also said that every article is written in the tone of big sister talking to little sister. That's how every article is big sister talking to little sister. And the message was, everybody's doing this. That's just good, innocent fun. What are you being such a stick in the mud for? Relax, enjoy your life. Gotta watch out for propaganda. It's everywhere, and it's always based on a kernel of truth. The propagandists are so good at it. They're so good at it. Most people don't even know they're, they're doing it. True story. Thanks later, spread the word. Hey, Slider Crusaders. So it has come to my attention that uh, not everyone knows these words that we're using and we're hearing all over the place all the time. Uh, I had five conversations last week with educated, informed people who are like, you know, watch the news and everything, who have, and I just like randomly, like I used the word, I was like, oh yeah, I mean, these critical theorists are out there. And they're like, well, I, I don't know, I've never, what are you talking about? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? How do you not, how do you not know this? And they're like, oh, I, don't, I don't know what that means. Uh, five times last week. So I was like, OK, all right. Let's take some time here. And let's go through a bunch of these words. Uh, I got 10 of them here. We'll go through these pretty quick. Just a couple sentences each. Uh, just all I think you need to know. And, and just know that each one of these has hours and hours of content. That we, I mean, like books and books are written about each of these. So we could really dive deep, but I think this is all you. I mean, college majors are about these topics. But uh, for our sake, uh, my goal here is we go over this little glossary of terms, if you will, and you'll be able to know them and define them quickly when you see other people use them. When you go to like a, a diversity, inclusion, equity seminar, uh, you'll be able to, you'll, you'll see the word like, you know, anti-racist or whatever. You'll be like, whoa, wait a second. I know what that really is. Um, so you can define it quickly. Feel free to send this video to someone else who you think should know these terms as well. Um, and obviously, you can. We have our app on the smartphone, on the the first app, first TV, and then YouTube and everywhere you can send all the clips and everywhere. Uh, I want to say one last thing. This is how they would describe these words. Okay, I'm being very fair here. I'm setting. You know, you have the straw man, and I think it's Eric um, Eric Weinstein or Brett who has this idea of the the, the uh, steel man. All right. So straw man is you set up a weak argument for your opponent and you just crush it down. The st steel man is you set up your opponent's argument stronger than they would. You make their opponent's argument so strong that they would be like, wow, I wish I put it like that. And then you crush it down, right? If there was a woke critical theorist right here, right now, they would agree with these definitions too. I'm not being unfair with any of this stuff. Cool. Good. All right. Let's do it. So first one, woke. We've all heard that word, right? Woke means that you are aware of the injustices of the world. You, because you're, you're awake now, you see society for the inherently racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, Islamophobic, whatever phobic world that it actually is. I mean, everyone else around there is walking around asleep, not seeing the world as it is, but you're awake, you get it, you are woke. I don't know if this is intentionally a play on Acts 918. Um, Acts 918 talks about it's the conversion of Paul, and it says uh, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. And he got up and was baptized. I don't know if it's an intentional play on that or if it just is like it just happens to be a, a similar theme. But there you go, there's woke, right? So are you woke or are you not woke? Or are you asleep? So what are these injustices that we're supposed to be aware of? That is Marxism. The most important thing to know about Marxism in this context, and goodness, I mean, there's tons of stuff about this, right? But the most important thing to know about this context is, is the Marxist worldview that everything is a battle between the oppressed and the oppressors. The oppressed and the oppressors. Now, Marx saw it on economic terms, right? He talked about the, uh, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, right? The landowners 
and the laborers. That's specifically who he was talking about with his economic terms, the rich and the poor. But since, so he was in the 1850s, uh, then you get uh, 1930s, you get the Frankfurt School, which we'll talk about next, and then uh, postmodernism, like the 60s or so, they took that oppressor-oppressed framework and they applied it to every form of oppression that could possibly exist. Okay, so again, Marx saw it on economic terms, but now these people came around like the 30s and the 60s and they're like, well, hold on. Not only do we have oppressed, oppressor and oppressed with landowner and, and uh, laborer, we also have it with straight people against gay people and white people against black people and, and, and uh, gay people against transgender people, right? You like, keep doing uh, men against women, right? So it's every form of oppression. Everything, all everywhere is, is oppression and a, and a power dynamic. And our world, therefore, our existence is defined by these oppressive relationships. And your individual life is defined by these oppressive relationships, which is intersectionality, which we'll get to next. But let's do Frankfurt School real quick, because I've thrown that word around there a lot, and maybe you've heard it. So Frankfurt School was a group of people uh, in Germany at the University of Frankfurt who started this field called critical theory. And we'll get to that term in a second, too. This is in the 1930s. Herbert Marcuse is a name that maybe you've heard and he comes out of, out, out of this group. So that's, that's, all, that's all we mean by the Frankfurt School. This is a group of philosophers in the 1930s who came up with all this crap. I mean, uh, deep intellectual thought. Uh, intersectionality. So intersectionality is the combination of oppressed groups that you are a member of. It's a combination of the oppressed groups that you're a member of, and this defines you as a person. So you're not Mary, you're a woman. Now you're not just a woman, you're a black woman. And you're not just that, you're, a, you're a, a black gay woman, or you're a black gay trans woman, or you're a black gay trans Muslim disabled woman, or whatever, right? You can see, you just keep going around. Right? And all the oppressed groups that you're a member of, they intersect with each other. That's the intersection part. Does that, does that part, like that's where intersectionality is? Like you're a member of this, this oppressed group and this oppressed group and they come together and they intersect and that's where you are. So you have, you have let's say, let's say you have women over here, they're oppressed here, and then you have uh, uh, gay people here, they're oppressed over here, here's all the women, here's all the gay people, and where they cross, that's where you are. That's your intersection, that's your intersectionality. Each claim, that's the point, first point. Second point, each claim of oppression that you have makes you more virtuous because you're more awake, you're more woke to the evils of the world, right? So, because you have a different lived experience. So you have women here, and women have one lived experience as, as being oppressed. But then you have gay people over here, and they have a lived experience of being oppressed. But where they intersect, pff, this person, this gay woman, has, a, has even a, they're more woke. They, they have a whole different lived experience and perspective of the evils of the world. So if you're not a gay woman, you must defer to the gay woman because she knows way more than you about the evils of the world. Now, if you are the worst of the worst, straight, white, middle-class male Christian, yours truly, you must defer to everyone because they have way more oppressed points than you and you can't possibly understand their perspective or the truth. And this goes all the way down the line, right? So like all the way down to gay people, even if you're like gay, or really the top of the Pyramid Olympics is, is this group. So even if you're like gay, black, female, disabled, what you're like, you got four points, you must defer to trans people. Trans people, they're the top, they're the gold medalist in the, in the um, intersectional oppressed Olympics, right? So they're, they're, they have the most woke perspective. So that's intersectionality, right? <clears throat> Literally yesterday, there was a headline in LGBTQ Nation. The headline was, this queer brown woman is running for Congress to dismantle the system. And you look at that and you're like, is that her name? Like, 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 first day of school, like, uh, Mary Smith here, uh, queer brown woman? Queer brown woman. Is queer brown woman in class today? Oh, yes, here. Oh, yes. What, do you go by queer or 
What, what, how should I refer to you? Queer brown woman. She has a name. Her name is Georgette Gomez. She's on the San Diego City Council and she's running for Congress. But to the left, all she is is queer brown woman. Three intersection victim points. Very woke. Uh, all right, we'll do one more. <clears throat> critical theory. So the very short of this. Um, if you're a critical theorist, you start with the assumption that there is a problematic power imbalance in everything. Your job is to find it and expose it. So racism is assumed to exist in every interaction, and every not only every interaction, like every personal action, but everything. Remember we did a story a while back of uh, this guy wrote this whole blowhardy article about, about um, how white pe like, people, white black people are so oppressed they even have to get permission from the white man to cross the street. I'm thinking, I realized, like, what are you talking about? You have to get permission from the white man to cross the street? And it's because the, uh, like, pedestrian traffic signal? Don't walk is the red hand, and the, the walk signal is the white guy. So the, 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 so the black, black people have to wait for the white man to tell them when it's safe to cross the street. Now, it turns out that it's white because that white is, it's, it's called like moon white, it's a very specific shade of white, and it's the most clear to see in the day and at night time is like a very specific scientific reason why they chose that color. But if you're a critical theorist, everything has to be racist. Oh, here's the white man telling black people when to cross the street, right? So that's a perfect example of a, of a critical theorist. And then the, they have to expose it and then dismantle it or disrupt it. So just take your kid's school. Uh, let's do Christopher Columbus, that's an easy one. So first of all, there's no such thing as objective truth, and there's no one way of knowing anything. That's a critical theorist thing. So we have to deconstruct the Christopher Columbus myth, and we have to find the racism, even if you have to make it up, of course, which is what they've done. So uh, Christopher Columbus was racist, right? Uh, colonization is racist, capitalism is racist, exploration is racist, everything involved is racist, it has to be, that's critical race theory, and you have to find it. And not only do you have to find it, teacher, but your job as a teacher is to reflect on your own racism, on how you teach Columbus. Right? So everything's racist, or everything's whatever-ist. Right? So it's from Columbus down, so it's so Columbus all the way down to you, the teacher, the parent, the very not racist person, it doesn't matter. Even if you think you're not racist, you've accepted the cultural hegemony. So therefore you are. That's another one. Let's do cultural hegemony acts. We gotta take a break. So we'll do, we'll do cultural hegemony. Uh, so what did we do so far? We did woke, Frankfurt School, critical theory, Marxism. There's one more I'm missing we just did. I forget, whatever. We got uh, critical hegemony. Uh, white, we'll do white fragility, anti-racist. And uh, there's one more I think we'll do next. Oh, let's talk about the march through the institutions. Let's do that. Okay, we'll wrap it up with that. We'll do that next. True story, Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Senator Crusaders. So real quick, if you're just tuning in, uh, last week I had five different conversations with very educated and well-informed people who didn't know these kind of basic terms that are being thrown out there and really explain everything that we're seeing right now. So I just want to take a couple minutes here and go through maybe the, the I think we got nine here, nine of the most basic terms of the woke cult that are that exists right now. So we just did uh, we just did woke, Marxism, Frankfurt School, intersectionality, that was the one I forgot and uh, critical theory. Okay, so let's do, uh, let's do a couple more. White fragility, white fragility is easy. This is the belief that all white people are racist at our core because of our white supremacist culture. So you are racist, there's nothing you can do about it. That's starting point one. Robin D'Angelo, author of White Fragility, she noticed that shockingly when she told people you're racist, they had a defensive reaction to it. <laughs> They'd say things like, no, I'm not. And she claimed that that reaction, that fragility is proof of their racism. That's the double bind. So there, there's white fragility. Uh, you can't win, it's total garbage. 
uh, anti-racist. This is a very important one. So the most popular book right now is White Fragility. The second most popular book is How to Be an Anti-Racist. You see this all the time. This is the leading idea in your, in our, um, in your workplace. And by the way, we don't have time to do it now, but we'll do it another day. And, and Jordan Peterson talks a bit about this. These postmodernists and these Marxists, they're not going for the high level like control of our government, of the federal government. They're not doing that because they'll never do that. What they're trying to do is take over more of the middle management of our life, which has much more control over your life than, than the federal government even does. And uh, the way they're doing it now is through HR departments, through these, these DIE seminars, diversity, inclusion, equity. So anyway, we'll talk about that another day. But uh, anti-racist is one of these things that you're definitely going to hear about because it, it sounds nice, right? Racist, bad. I want to be anti a bad thing. So, I, right? so I, yeah, I want to be an anti-racist. How to, well, hold on. Anti-racist means a very specific thing. It doesn't mean anti the bad thing. It's a very specific thing. You have to actively act in specific progressive ways. You have to actively support specific progressive policies all so that we can have a racial equity of outcome. That's the big point here. To be anti-racist is to support whatever it takes to get an equity in outcome. So that's what equity is in woke speak. It doesn't mean equality of opportunity, it means equality of outcome. We used to believe in American equality of opportunity, but to be an anti-racist means equality of outcome, meaning the proportional, uh, you have to have the proportion, the demographically proportional correct number of, let's say, black people in every profession or in every position of leadership or your church, which is something we're going to talk about tomorrow specifically, um, all the way down the line, right? So everything has to be equal in every single way, which is an impossible thing. But I mean, that, when, when has that ever stopped a communist? Uh, one of his quotes the, from the anti-racist guy uh, is, uh, he said, the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination, and the only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. <laughs> so we've been trained to think discrimination is bad, but here now it's, it's good. It just has to be on their own terms. Cool. So that's anti-racist. Don't fall for that one. It's a very uh, well-worded trick they got on you. Uh, hegemony is a funny word. Hegemony. I always mispronounce it. I always pronounce it hegemony. Yeah, I pronounce it hegemony usually, like matrimony, hegemony, because it's hegemonic, but hegemony, when, anyway. Uh, so in ancient Greece, the hegemony, 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 see, I got it wrong. The hegemony was, uh, let's say you had one city-state and they would be like the dominant city-state over all the other city-states. And it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It was just like, this is the city-state that's in the leadership position. Then it became to mean just rule, just general rule that you rule over. Now, uh, the 20th, 20th century uh, Frankfurt School people took it to mean a dominance. So it's a, it's a, it's a, bad, it's a negative connotation now, hegemony does. So cultural hegemony, it just means the dominant culture. That's all that means. Cultural hegemony, it's fancy, fancy jargon speak for the dominant culture. We live in America, and it's well, white supremacist culture is the dominant culture. They also took over the word white supremacist, right? When you think white supremacist, what do you think? They have a Klan member, right? It's a white supremacist. But they don't mean that. They mean it more like, uh, like all-encompassing. So white culture is hegemonic. It's dominant. It's the majority culture. It's supreme over all others. So it's white supremacy. See, see what they did there? So they made it like... Because at the very beginning, you remember this. They're like, oh, that's white supremacist. And you're like... Who's wearing the Klan hoods? Like, what do you mean it's a white supremacist thing? That's what they mean. They just mean it's the dominant culture. It's the white supremacist culture. It's the supreme culture. Does that make sense? They've like, they've like watered the meaning of that word down. But still, for most people, it has the very serious connotation of a Klan. But now they can claim, therefore, that everyone is a part of the Klan if you're not anti-racist. Anyway, so because of this, um, a couple things. First, uh, all white... So, so White culture is racist. The cultural hegemony, white culture is racist. So all white people are racist. But here's the most important part. Everyone who's of color, not white, is oppressed and can't live their authentic culture or their authentic selves because they're forced to exist 
in the cultural hegemony dominant white culture. Therefore, they're oppressed by, just by default because they're living in a white supremacist culture. This is where you get stuff like, uh, and I think the um, Smithsonian put this out too in their, their infographic, that uh, white, white culture, white people food is bland and Hispanic food is so flavorful. Right? So that's a metaphor for Hispanics need to whitewash their lives in order to conform and they can't eat the flavorful food that they love so much they have to eat potatoes like white people. Uh, all right, I gotta go. Let's do the long march to the institutions real quick. So there's this guy, Louis Altier, uh, French guy. <clears throat> he's probably the most relevant here. He's a French Marxist in the 50s. Uh, by the way, in 1980, he strangled his wife to death, but that's neither here nor there. So he says that there are two things. You have repressive state apparatuses, and that's the police and the military, and then you have ideological state apparatuses, ISA as he called them. So to bring on the Marxist revolution, so if Karl Marx says, oh, this Marxist revolution, it's any day now, any day now, any day now, and it never happened. And then Gramsci came along in the 1920s in Italy and said, any day now, any day now, any day now. And then this guy came along in the 50s and like, any day now, any day now, any day now. And it never happened. So to make it happen, he said, we need to take over these institutions from within. And he defined these ideological institutions as the church, education system, family, legal system, uh, the political system, but like mid-level, regional, like school board, stuff like that, uh, the press, uh, unions, TV, literature, arts, and sports. He even put sports down, which is what they've done. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious that the left has done all these things. So that's the long march through the institutions. Take over each institution from within and change culture that way. So there you go. There's your term. So we did uh, woke, Marxism, Frankfurt School, intersectionality, critical theory, white fragility, anti-racist. Went through white supremacists in there a little bit and then marched through the institutions, I think, to all of them. So there you go. So please, uh, now you know, and feel free to send this off to other people. Our YouTube is an easy way to send it off so that they can uh, understand all these things as well. Because this is the root of everything that's happening right now. If you believe this stuff or not, God know what we're fighting against. True story. Mike Slater, Steve Morris, by the way.